When I was, how old are you, Ruby? Nine. Nine. Roman, how old are you? Six. Good. Well, when I was both of your ages, I started when I was six doing this. My friends and I would go outside of the new neighborhood that had been built right after the Korean War that my parents bought a home in. And we'd go just to the other side of it, literally one street away. My street, then the next street, then cornfields as far as you could see. And we'd go back in those cornfields and we would build forts. We'd dig them sometimes in the earth, sometimes we'd build them up in trees, sometimes we would find some kind of natural fortification and finish off the sides. And now they weren't like ancient forts, like castles where kings would live, that kind of thing. They were more modern than that. The kind of forts that would have things like bombs in them. I don't know if forts really have. Oh, yeah, I got your attention now, didn't I, Rome? So, here's what we would do. We would go out into those cornfields in the fall, about this time after the summer harvest had been brought in in Ohio, a little bit ahead of us down here, and you'd see uh, for just acres and acres and acres, you'd see the stubble of corn, where the harvesters had come across and clipped them off, and it would leave the, the trunk of the corn sticking up out of the ground about yay far. And the soil in Ohio is dramatically different than it is in North Carolina. In many ways. I'll, I'll name just a couple. Here, the soil is what color? Red. You, you mean it never varies? It sure doesn't. Everywhere I look, the soil is red down here. But in Ohio, for acres and miles, if you look out in these plowed fields, do you know what color? Well, Holly will tell you what color the soil is. Black. Black. Black, so black, black as Rusty's camera. It's black soil. And it's not like the, the red soil down here has the consistency of clay. clay. You all know these things. Why am I up here talking about it? But in Ohio, it's that, that black soil doesn't have the consistency of clay. What is it like, Holly? Crumbly. It's crumbly. It's loamy. It's, it's very aerated. It's full of oxygen, this black soil. It's great for growing stuff, but it's also great for kids to be able to go around after the harvesters have come through and bend over and grab one bit of the corn stalk that's left with one hand and grab the one in the other furrow or the one next to it and pull them both out. You just pull them right out of the ground easily because of that loamy, loose soil. They just come right out. And all that black soil is clinging to the root structure of those corn stalks. And if you get up in a tree with those bombs, <laughs> and your unsuspecting neighborhood friends, I use the term loosely, come walking by and you're quiet enough, you can bomb them from the treetops. <laughs> Poor Richard's looking at me going, and we called this guy as our pastor. <laughs> and we did. We bombed people mercilessly. We would sit in the trees all morning long. We would haul them up there and store them up in the tree trunks and just wait for people to come by and bomb them all morning long. Great fun. And if they reacted properly, we'd let them climb up in the treetops with us and bomb anybody else that came by. But if they reacted improperly, like if they didn't think it was as fun as we did, we just let them go on their way while we started tossing them at them. Fortification, forts, little kingdoms that we begin to build even when we're Roman's age. Even, if, even when we're six years old, we begin to, to do these things. We begin to stake out our territory and include some people and uninclude other people. It seems to be a natural part of what it means to grow up in this world. <coughs> Let us pray. Well, first of all, Lord, I want to thank you for corn. For the reasons that I like corn now, not then. 
We thank you also for your word which feeds us. And we ask that you would fill us with your word this morning in a way that will satisfy us throughout the week. Bring us back to the readings that Susan read often during the week. And if possible, Lord, speak through me even now. In Christ's name, amen. Grace and peace to all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love that first hymn where we named God. Did you hear that in the last verse? We sang to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, uh, whom we name as God. I love that language. And that uh, very last phrase, it went something like, and, and we embrace this mystery. I just love the, the language of the last verse of our first hymn and encourage you to look at it again later. Or now if you got it. In the first reading this morning, God talks about warnings. He talks to the prophet about warnings, that warnings ought to be made. Now, it just so happens that in the NALC's devotion this morning, on a completely different uh, group of texts than we uh, deal with today, that's what the uh, pastor, Pastor uh, Corbell, uh, has written about. These warnings that you have people that you need to warn. About what? Well, depending on who you know, maybe about a lot of things. But we have people that we need to warn. We have people that we need to let know that there is a kingdom rushing upon the earth. In fact, the kingdom is already here. And they're either in the kingdom or they're out of the kingdom. Very much like that. I can still see that tree with the stream running next to it in my childhood. Very much like that kingdom there. You were either in or you were out. That's the way it is with God's kingdom. You're either in it or you're not. And you know the people that you know who are in it, and you know people whom you know that are not in it. And what does the first reading say that if you don't warn them, they will die in their iniquity, but their blood guilt is upon who? You. You'll be responsible before the eyes of God in judgment for those people that you need to warn. Ezekiel can't warn them all. You've got to warn some of them. But if you warn them, and they heed your words, well, glory. But if they don't heed your words, if they refuse to believe, there are people like that out there, right? Then their blood guilt's upon themselves, not upon you. You've done your job. You have warned them. So I'm warning you this morning. Warn them. They need to be warned. You know, we have a whole generation, it seems like, uh, beginning to grow up in this country, who, <clears throat> who think they never sin. Have you noticed? We have a whole generation in this country that think everything's owed to them, that they never sin, that they're God's little angels, if God even exists at all. And so they, they've got it due to them. It's up to you to let them know what's really come and do. That's up to you. It's not up to the pastors. It's not up to the preachers. It's not up to the evangelists. It's up to all of us to let them know what is going to come do. Now, they're not going to like to hear it. But if they don't hear it from you, who are they going to hear it from? Well, they're not going to listen to me. I can hear you thinking right now. Oh, they'll just reject me. Better somebody else comes along that they might listen to. Look, you're just the messenger, but the message, he is the one who will get through to them. But he will use you. So warn them. Let them know. Otherwise, the blood guilt will be on whose hands? Your hands. How could you not have been reminded of Hurricane Harvey and now Hurricane Irma when we read the last line of the psalm today. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. Well, I'll tell you, the great waters have surely overflowed and have reached a lot of people in the past two weeks. 
20-some trillion gallons of water falling on Texas. That's a lot of water. I want you to think, however, about some different water. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. I am reminded first, even before Harvey, I am reminded of the waters of baptism. And you should be too. When the great waters, now we're talking about chaos and death here. This is what's on the psalmist's mind. But isn't that what the waters of baptism are? Aren't they waters of death? You don't think about it that way, do you? Because you think about the new life that you have in Christ because of baptism. But that's because you've been buried into Christ's death into the waters of baptism. So that death shall not reach you. Read the psalm that way. When the great waters of baptism overflow you, death now shall not reach you. Just want to help you think about how to listen to the scripture. But when we get into the gospel lesson today, Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom because his disciples are very anxious about this business of the kingdom. Who gets to go up in little Ryman's treehouse and drop corn bombs on the neighborhood kids? Is it me, Lord? Is it me? Who's going to be the greatest in that kingdom? See, that's, the, that's kind of the way they always thought about things, those disciples. Am I going to be the greatest? You know, if you're like me, you're just going to be happy to get in, right? You remember when you uh, picked uh, teams for neighborhood football games, baseball games, any kind of games? Remember how you picked teams? What did you always want to be? The first one picked. I don't know why, but when I was a kid, a young kid, I could scamper back then. I can't do it now. But I could move. You couldn't catch me. And I could intercept passes all day long because I could see where that ball was going to go before it even came out of the quarterback's hands. I always wanted to be picked last. Always. I always wanted to be on the, the, uh, the, the, the team that got the short end of the stick. Have you ever noticed that's how it happens on playgrounds a lot? Somebody picks uh, the, the toughest guys, the biggest guys. They're always going to get on that other team and then on the other team. And they'll even make trades to make sure it happens. You know how it works. You've been there. You've done it. I always wanted to be last. I always wanted to be on that loser team. Always. I even play cards like that today. I want to be on the loser team. Not necessarily the team that's going to lose, but the loser team. But what if you don't get to be on a team at all? What if you waited till last so that you could be on that other team and the sides were already even and you were the odd guy out? Then you don't get to be in that little kingdom at all. You don't get to play the game at all. What then? Kind of goes back to Ezekiel, doesn't it? Being the odd man out because nobody warned me what was coming. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Can you see the look on Jesus' face? I mean, several chapters earlier, Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Thy kingdom come. And at that point, those poor disciples must have been thinking, kingdom, there's going to be a kingdom, it's coming, I wonder if I can be the greatest in it. All this time, that's what they were thinking about. Jesus must have just shook his head. Really, this is what you want? You want to know who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And in Jesus' wonderful way, without quite saying it, he looks at them and says, none of you. That's what his response really says, isn't it? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of the Lord? Not one of you guys. That's for sure. And this is what he does. He pulls uh, Luke out in front of him. Got his pacifier in his mouth, longing for his mom. Boy, why has Jesus got me out here in front of these stupid disciples again? And he shows them little Luke and he says, unless you become like little Luke, 
You not only won't be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you won't even make it into the kingdom of heaven. Now I'll tell you what. Have you ever watched the kids after church uh, own Hayworth Miller Funeral Home? <laughs> Have you seen that happen? Uh, I, I love that. Uh, I, I want to take some responsibility for it also. Uh, get, getting them going on that kind of uh, fun and games around here. Uh, in some of my churches in the past, we even had pew races. We'll get into that in another time. Uh, no, it's, it's not like the, uh, the local uh, apostolic church where they run across the top of the pews. It's a different kind of pew race altogether. So, I'll bet you anything that when we play those games after church, if you watch, little Luke is just overjoyed to be included. Just to be part of this little kingdom of kids. <coughs> He's not thinking, I want to be in charge here. Yet. <laughs> I want to be in charge. I want to be the greatest amongst these kids. He's not thinking that. He just wants to be a part of it. What do the disciples want? Do they just want to be part of this great and glorious kingdom of God on earth? Or do they want to be in charge? Do they want to be the greatest? Do they want to have the last say? Now, let's stop thinking about Luke. Let's stop thinking about the disciples. And let's think about you. What do you want? <laughs> you know, there are people in churches. I'll bet you it's going to be this way in Abilene too. There are people in churches who have just got to be in charge. Have you ever noticed that? Got to be in charge. Got to have the last word. Got to have it their way. None of you have ever noticed this before? I must have been going to all the wrong churches all my life. It happens in every church. I am so thankful. As I've said before, I'm so thankful to be the pastor of Grace Lutheran Church where it's a mission congregation and we're really focused upon that kind of good stuff, but our day is a coming. <laughs> because, as Pastor Ernie likes to say, and we like to quote him, because after all, it is the church. <laughs> this is what churches do. There'll be this little kingdom and that little kingdom. Oh, we call them committees. <laughs> and somebody's going to have to be in charge and which committee is going to be the most important now you would think by default it would be council but not so in all churches our day is coming and if you get somebody who really thinks high of themselves one of those Peter, James or John type folks They'll make sure that they're greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They will wrestle it to the ground. They will bomb you from the treetops relentlessly until you give in, Pastor, and let me be greatest in the kingdom of this church. Does this sound familiar? Do you know it's true? These are people... I hate to say it, but just for our own good. These are people who may not even make it into the kingdom of heaven. Why do I say that? Because that's what Jesus said. Unless you become like Luke, unless you become like this little child, I'm not making this up, right? Is that the same text that you read? We need to be very, very careful. Whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We have people who come to churches and just, you can, you can tell who they are because they're the people who sit in church like this. They make faces. None of you make these faces. Not a single one of you make those faces. I'm so glad. But there are people who do because there are children in the church. And they're making noise. And they're... And so, what is that person doing? They're calling attention to themselves. 
and they're not paying attention to another thing. The child that makes the noise is getting more out of the service than that person. <coughs> right? How can you become like that little child and be like that? It would be better if that person went over and sat with the little child and they had a little party together during church than to sit there with that grimace on their face and then complain about it afterwards in the parking lot. You're supposed to become like that child. Like that child. Not to resent that child. Nowhere in the gospel does Jesus say, if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, resent the children. No. He said, bring them to me. Smelly diapers and all. Bring them on. That's who we want in church. And by the way, as we grow uh, as a church, don't let anybody ever uh, sweep this one by you. Don't ever go there. We need to start children's church. Children's church is started by these people. <laughs> don't have to. This is children's church. Why do we have children's church? So they learn how, how things go in church. So you take them out? <laughs> this is where you learn how things go in church. This is where you learn to sing the Kyrie for the rest of your life. This is where that happens. We had a yard sale at our home, in fact, in, in the neighborhood surrounding our home yesterday. And you know, the best part of the yard sale for Susan and I is getting to meet people and talk to people. We, we just enjoy it so much, meeting folks. And one lady came up and uh, just wanted to visit for a well, while. Several ladies did that, wanted to visit for a while. Uh, while Susan was talking to him, I was standing there going. Uh, no, we, we had a good time talking to this one lady uh, when she found out because uh, one of the two people standing on the driveways of Blabbermouth found out that I'm a Lutheran pastor. She said that... Uh, one of her friends is Lutheran, and she goes to that uh, Lutheran church sometimes with her friend, but she, she, she gets lost because she's not used to the... To, she's, she said, do you do that liturgy thing? I said, oh, yes, we do. Um, <laughs> well, well I, I, I don't do it enough, and I don't know what's coming next, and I, I, well, you, know, you need to grow up as a child. In the church, and then, and then you know it. But or you can just come for several Sundays and do it, and then you'll figure it out. And at, at Grace, one of the things that we do is we look for those people who are uh, stumbling around a little bit, and uh, and we get tapped on the shoulder to go sit with that person and, and help them find their way through. Or we tell them every now and then we're on page sixty-five where you'll find the Nicene Creed. Pause, 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 and then we go. So. I said, she said, well, do you say it or do you sing it? And I said, well, we, we sing it. And she goes, oh. I said, well, at his church, what she said, a little both. I said, okay, well, I guess we do a little both too. But we sing it, why? Why do we sing the liturgy? Just because there's notes there? Why do we sing it? Anybody? Yeah, so we'll remember it. Uh, how many of you sing uh, some uh, stupid top 40 song that you don't even like and you sing it all week long and you go, stop doing that? You ever done that? I've done that a lot. Or some radio jingle or television commercial uh, jingle. Uh, you know, a lot of these things, they've been so successful that all they have to do is play the music. They don't have to say one blessed word. And you know it was about this product or that product just for the music because it's so embedded in you. And that's exactly why, uh, 40 years after I left St. Luke Lutheran Church, as a kid, 40 years later, I'm still singing the Kyrie. I don't even know where it came from. I, I figured it was from that church, but I'm still singing those words. And I'm singing them at the most appropriate time. St. Augustine, I was telling this lady on our driveway yesterday, St. Augustine in, in the 4th century, he said, He who sings prays twice. He who sings prays twice. And the way that comes alive for me is because when, when I sing the prayers on Sunday morning, that's once. But then Tuesday afternoon, when I just happen to sing it because the Spirit moves in me, I'm praying twice. That's why we sing the liturgy. 
That's why we want children in church singing the liturgy with us. Learning those words that will comfort them for a lifetime. As they've comforted you, no doubt. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Luke's. Rubies. Romans. And those who would humble themselves and be like them. So, instead of getting a, a cup of coffee and a donut or some of those other uh, good uh, garden variety things that Holly and Dan have been bringing lately, uh, you could run around and, and play tag with me and the kids afterwards if you wanted to. And if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, that's what you've got to do today. That's your assignment. But I just want to put it this way. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. How does the kingdom come on earth? Well, there are lots of ways. But one of the greatest ways is for you and for me to humble ourselves as these little children so that it may.